so, so giving some sort of like general philosophy of uh, how I do research, I guess. Uh, so first, uh, you start with an observation, but just fun. Okay, for example, did you know that Mount Everest grows by four millimeters in height every year? Okay, let's say we know this for the last hundred years because that's how long we have known that Mount Everest is the highest peak. Okay, okay. Now I'm gonna put this into language that makes me more comfortable, which is suppose for each um, time slice, uh, you have an R3 with Mount Everest sitting in it. So you have this like Mount Everest cross interval sitting in R4, and there's a slightly smaller Mount Everest on this side and a slightly larger Mount Everest on that side. Um, and what this means is that M, Mount Everest, this is a cobordism. Okay, so this is a four dimensional object with boundary, which is Mount, two copies of Mount Everest. And there's a height function, okay, which measures height from sea level um, such that so there are two peaks, peak at time zero and peak at time one. And the height of peak at time one is higher than the height of peak at time zero. Okay, I like this language better. Um, and then you can ask some questions. Will Mount Everest always grow? Like if I did these measurements thousand years from today or like two million years before, will I get a similar picture? Will it always be higher? And you can ask like, if I take a different mountain, I go to the Alps, uh, will this happen? It's not true that it happens. Like some mountains actually shrink because there's more erosion than growth. Okay, okay. But so this is, the language I like to talk in. I'm not a geologist, so I don't actually think about Mount Everest. Uh, what I think about is something slightly different. Okay, so look at R4. We saw R4 in the last slide, but now look at this uh, two form on it. There's a standard coordinates, the paired off. Okay, this is a two form. I like that form. Um, and uh, what is a Lagrangian? It's a surface. Uh, it could have boundary such so that this form vanishes on it. Okay. Cool. Um, now let's look at a picture that's similar to Mount Everest thing, but instead of Mount Everest, I have a copy of the circle S1. Okay, so I have one S1 uh, in R3 at time zero and one at R3 at time one. And the whole cobordism is Lagrangian now. It satisfies some nice conditions. And um, the observation is that exists such a Lagrangian cobordism in R4 such that if the boundary circles look like this with some area that's colored in, which is the area of the projection into R2, um, and the areas like B and A, that area B is bigger than the area A, okay? So you can write this Lagrangian down in whatever equations you like. Okay, so then you can ask questions if for any Lagrangian cobordism, if the boundaries look like this eight plus object with some area A and B, Will, it, will B always be greater than A? And you could also ask, um, what if these slices look slightly different? Like, what if I change the crossings? What if I draw a trefoil instead of an unknot? What happens, okay? Um, so this is the question I've been obsessing with for some time now. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you how you could think about such things. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Morse flow lines, okay? What is a Morse flow line? So suppose this Mount Everest cobordism is back and we have the height function and it's nice enough that with, I don't know, uh, it's Morse. So Morse means that whenever the gradient vanishes, the Hessian is invertible. So it gives you nice, uh, these things called flow lines. So what is a flow line? It's a path uh, in the entire manifold M such that the starting and ending point here, I've chosen them to be peak one and peak zero. And the differential is uh, the gradient of my head function. Okay, so suppose I have such a path in this uh, mountain cobordism, then what do I get? Um, well, we can do some integration and you have that the head differs by that integral. And if you replace things, um, this side I've just put in the P zeros. And on this side, um, you get the square of the gradient. It's a dot product, but whatever. Um, if you pretend some things are in R zero, I don't know. Um, so if you somehow know that this quantity is positive, 
then you know that the height is increasing, right? Um, yeah. Okay, great. So a moral of this slide is if you have a nice enough flow line and a nice enough function, uh, you can show that something's increasing. And now the question is, well, I told you about this thing that I'm actually interested in. Can we do things here, which looks similar? Um, sometime in the 90s, uh, this genius called Andreas Flor had the idea that he's going to do Morse functions um, on infinite dimensional spaces. Okay, I'm going to talk about them now. Um, okay, so that's Flor theory. And how does it happen in this setup? So suppose I change that Lagrange and I had a little bit. And now the boundaries, instead of being like Emma, uh, embedded circles, they have a self intersection. So there's some double points. But on the interior, it looks exactly how it did before. Okay, so some change at the boundary. But basically, now you have an immersed Lagrangian uh, with two double points. Everything else is nice and embedded. Okay, um, I can look at the space of paths, okay, with boundary, uh, like starting and ending point on my Lagrangian. So it looks like that gamma over there. Um, and on this space, so this is an infinite dimensional space, I can look at this function which to each path assigns um, that integral, which is, so what is u gamma? It's a disk with one boundary that's gamma and the other boundary that's sitting on the Lagrangian. Okay, so it's like that purple stuff there. Um, and you integrate the form omega that we started with, the symplectic form on it. So, well, this gives you a nice function if you assume nice things about your Lagrangian. And, um, Notice that if you have a constant path, which is um, like here, the intersection points B and A, uh, the constant path, the, the U gamma for that constant path is the entire node. And so the area, uh, area or whatever of like B and A are the quantities capital B and capital A that I was comparing some time back, okay? Okay, and then what else is cool about this function? If you do a gradient, um, so a gradient for this is a vector field along the path. Um, it's going to be that quantity where I is a complex multiplication for the standard complex form on R4. Okay, great. So that also tells you that the critical points are exactly the constant paths. Okay, so what do we do now? What is a flow line? It's a path from R, the subscript S is the coordinate, into my paths. So that some equation is satisfied. If you rewrite it and move the interval from the path space into the side, uh, you just get the cauchy riemann equation. So what I'm looking for when I'm looking for flow lines is a um, holomorphic strip, okay? From, uh, so a holomorphic map from a strip, which has limits at A and B, the points that I was getting about for some time. Cool? Very good. Okay, so now how do I find such a holomorphic strip? I haven't told you how to do that. And then comes in work of like other people. So I guess at the same time that Flora was doing this stuff, uh, Kromov was doing some compactness for like holomorphic curves. And you can like uh, try adapting those theorems into your conditions, put all your boundary conditions. So that's what I did. That's why there's a small D over there. Um, what I do, suppose, um, this is the Lagrangian, and there's a pink B that I care about. Um, I'm going to look at the moduli space. So that means all disks, uh, which are holomorphic and have boundary on this Lagrangian L, have, they have one corner. So that's like a singularity at the same point B, and they're in the same relative homology class. Okay, so that defines um, a moduli space. And um, you can show that it's compact by doing some things. Um, and then you do some index calculations and show that it's one dimensional. And then you show some transversality stuff. So it's a manifold, blah, blah, blah. But all this happens um, after you add in these things called broken disks, which in this picture is like this green C and that horizontal A. So you have to add like multiple disks, which still satisfy those conditions with the sufficient generalization of what disk means. OK. Um, so now, turns out that the B that we started with is a boundary point of this one-dimensional moduli space. 
one dimensional model S waves have even number of boundary points. So now you look at the other boundary point, and that is this like very suggestively drawn C and B over uh, A over here, the combination. And this, um, this C that you see here is the flow line that we're looking for. Okay. Um, so because the flow theory, you think about studying holomorphic things, but you use different techniques there to like find the holomorphic uh, strips that you want. Great. So once you find this, you can like uh, make statements about which areas are like growing. Um, and you can make that. So there was one of the questions is like, what happens if you change the knot diagrams? And you can like change the crossings, turn them into trefoils. And like in this picture, all the like pink areas are bigger than the yellow areas. Okay. And what you can see is that if I change the crossings from whatever I call plus to what I call minus, um, the the, the like direction things are increasing and changes. Okay, so plus signs are making the areas grow and minus signs are making them shrink. That's like sort of moral. Okay, so I did all this in my yes. What's the difference between the top two? Um, the crossing is different with respect to like x to the third coordinate. Oh, I drew it wrong. Oh. <laughs> That's why. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Thank you for the question. That should be drawn opposite. Okay. Like you have to reflect. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, but in the bottom one, it's proper. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. One question. Okay. Cool. Um, now I said something about algebraic invariance. Um, so what algebraic invariance? Now, if you have like thought about Mars theory at some point, people take those Mars flow lines and put it together into a like a homology and there are a lot of maths if you have a cobordism and blah, blah. Can these holomorphic strips do that also? Obviously, that's the question you asked. And the answer is yes. Um, before I tell you more about that, I'm gonna tell you what more homology looks like. Okay, um, Mount Everest is back. So if you take one copy of Mount Everest um, and you have the height function, the, the change um, is, um, you take the module of a Z mod two uh, generated by the critical points of F. So it's those red points. Um, and the differential is obtained by counting how many flow lines exist. So you take a X, suppose it's the peak, um, and the coefficient of Y in the differential will be the number of flow lines that go from X to Y. I'm saying number. Um, so you only take those y's for which the set of flow lines is zero dimensional. So you can do counting, okay? And if you set that up, it actually becomes a differential. You have to do some work to show that. And then you can take the homology, okay? It's a nice invariant. Um, and then if you have a cobardism, you could additionally count flow lines that go from like the top copy to the bottom copy by arranging your gradient, like your metric nicely so that that makes sense. Um, and you count similar things to get this J map, which is a chain map. So it gives you a map between the homologies. Cool. Okay, so if you want to extend this idea to um, the floor setting, um, you take one slice. So in that picture, it would just be the projection in R2. Um, a one dimensional manifold in R2 is Lagrangian always for the standard for anything, but yeah. Um, and then Instead of, taking, um, instead of taking a module over Z mod 2, I'm going to take an algebra. Um, so I'm allowing like more things than just strips. That makes sense, but it's slightly more complicated. And the differential is counted by like counting holomorphic disks, which have like one starting point and multiple ending points. So a strip had one starting point and one ending point. This is slightly more complicated. And then I put a big star and like sweeping all of the actual content of the geometry um, into the other room and saying that, okay, for like some good conditions, you can set this up and you get a differential. So you get a differential for your top boundary and for your bottom boundary. You get two of them, right? Now it turns out you have to do something slightly different here. You come up with a homology similarly for the entire Lagrangian, okay? Um, you can do it by defining the same things. Just you're going one dimension up, but the objects are the same dimension. Okay, 
And then now if you count um, these uh, flow lines going uh, inside the entire object, you actually get two maps, one going from top to bottom in some sense, and one going in the opposite direction. Um, and uh, so it's slightly different from the Mars stuff I was showing, but this bottom map didn't exist. But now there's some difference. So you can think of this as um, the mountains that were like shrinking. Um, and the top part represents the mountains that were growing. And you can have a mountain where one side is shrinking and one side is growing. So you have to like combine all of that into this information. Um, for people who've seen such things before, uh, this top part recovers something called the Chandrian contact homology, um, by which I mean, if all of these objects, like the slices, the knots, satisfied an additional condition called being the Chandrian for some contact form, then this bottom complex will, um, will be there, but the J minus becomes identity, and the top maps recovers um, the covertism maps in the Chandrian contact homology. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Can one give a completely combinatorial description of this? Do you actually need holomorphic curve? No. Um, you don't need holomorphic curve. So there was this star thing that I wrote down, uh, which would, like, then you would only have to, like, look at groups with some signs. Uh, they're like multiple sets of signs, and if some conditions satisfy, you count all of those uh, groups of points, and then it should work out. So um, to like use this, I guess, or like to compute it, you probably don't need a lot of stuff. But it could be rather complex, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, in particular, for like J minus and J plus, I think you would be counting um, disconnected holomorphic disks, so yeah. Yeah. So you started to tell us, what did you do in your thesis? Oh, in my thesis, I did like the, the first bit where there were picture. Uh, um, I did all of this, oh, and um, which implied this stuff. Uh -huh. So, so like, that, that, but it, but what the but the, was the result known ahead of time, and you produced a different set. Um, for what is, is this, it's still, the result was known for like the top things, but uh -huh. they're actually uh, top like smooth or not. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I extended it to uh -huh. things which are not topologically or not. Oh, okay. And um, I think you can oh, get yes, right, yeah. Yeah, the top part was known uh, by work of Josh Sablock from Talking to Now and Lisa Trainer, and they did it using like generating functions, which is like Morse theory on drugs. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but this is like a different method. More questions? Thank you.